als zwei Männer genau das taten, wovon Milliarden von Menschen auf der ganzen Welt träumten und auch heute noch tun. Nämlich zum Mond reisen, einen Spaziergang auf der Mondoberfläche, die unendlichen Weiten des Weltalls entdecken. Dieses Thema fasziniert auch heute noch unzählige Menschen, ob jung, ob alt. Für Buzz Aldrin und Neil Armstrong wurde dieser Traum Wirklichkeit. Sie betraten als erste Menschen den Mond. Rund 600 Millionen Fernsehzuschauer weltweit erlebten die Live-Übertragung und fieberten beim größten Ereignis des 20. Jahrhunderts mit. Für nur 24 Menschen wurde die Reise zum Mond im Rahmen des Apollo-Programms zwischen Dezember 1968 und Dezember 1972 zur Wirklichkeit. Und nur zwölf davon haben den Mond oben. In seiner Präsentation berichtet er über seinen Werdegang, seine Ausbildung, die Erfahrung und die Erlebnisse als Astronaut, sowie über seine Visionen für die Zukunft der bemannten Raumfahrt. I would like to say a few personal words. Uh, it's for me a privilege and a great pleasure today to welcome you here in the Technik Museum Speyer. After our first project back in 2008, the book project The Moon for the German Space Agency DLR, it's a great pleasure to have you here visiting with the biggest space exhibition in Europe, Apollo and beyond. I would like to say anything further except the stage is yours in a few minutes. But before, we would like to start with your Apollo 11 video. Thank you. 
There's something to be said for teamwork. The most extraordinary achievements in human history have come from people with unique perspectives. 
and assets coming together to reach a common goal. Look around you. There are numerous examples of that right here in this museum. The Technic Museum Spire. <laughs> in, the, in the Space Lab Training Module, and the landing capsule of the Soyuz mission, TM-19 and more. But before I get ahead of myself, let me tell you a little bit about my grand adventure, which never could have happened without the cooperation and efforts of many people working together as a team. And then I'll share with you a little bit about what I think we should be doing for our next giant leap. Consider this, mankind had always dreamt for centuries of reaching space, the moon, and even the stars. But it seemed an impossible dream. It wasn't until the 20th century that man took his first powered flight in 1903 on a windy, windy morning at Kitty Hawk. The Wright Brothers flyer took their first flight defying gravity. My mother, Marion, Moon was born that same year. I took my first flight at age two with my father, Edwin Eugene Aldrin. He was an engineer and an aviation pioneer, a friend of many early figures like Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh and Orville Wright. That time, I flew in a Lockheed Vega single-engine plane painted red to look like an eagle. Surrounded by the influence of aviation, I knew I wanted to be a pilot and serve my country. When I was 17 years old, I entered the military academy at West Point and four years later, I graduated third in my class. After leaving the military academy, I joined the Air Force, following my father's footsteps. Here I am during a photo op. Photo op. You photographers, pay attention. With my father, the day that I received my Air Force wings, you don't think they'd let me fly with my father. No, that was just a picture taken. He was a civilian aviation manager for the Standard Oil Company, where he directed the aviation fuel division. He later became the manager of Newark Airport in New Jersey. He also worked as a consultant to the manned spaceflight safety director of NASA. After training, flight training, I was in the Korean War as a jet fighter pilot where I flew 66 combat missions in my F-86 Sabre jet and shot down two enemy MiG-15 Aircraft. <laughs> following, following the Korean War, I was stationed about a two hour drive from here in Bitburg, Germany. And I was I was on alert flying F-100s in the late 1950s. The Cold War was pretty active then. 
between the Soviet Union and the United States. It was escalating and tensions were high. In October of 1957, October 4th, while I was still stationed here in Germany, the Soviet Union pulled off a sudden and unexpected technological feat. They launched Sputnik, beep, 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 into orbit. In direct response, the United States formed the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. The space age was born and the space race had begun. On April 12, 1961, the Soviets achieved another great feat when they sent the first human into space, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, the first man to orbit the Earth. Only a few weeks later, NASA launched the first Mercury astronaut, Alan Shepard, on only a 15-minute suborbital flight that touched the edge of space. This was impressive, but we all wonder what is next. President Kennedy asked NASA and its engineers and rocket scientists, led by Werner von Braun, what could be done? They told him, it would take at least 15 years before we could put a man on the moon. Instead of accepting what he was told was possible, on May 25, 1961, just three weeks after Alan Shepard's flight, President Kennedy boldly challenged America to commit to the goal of landing a man on the moon before the end of the decade. We hadn't even put any man into orbit yet. The rockets, the spacecraft needed to go beyond Earth orbit didn't exist. Many thought the challenge to be impossible. We didn't have the know-how. But we did have a leader with the vision, the determination, and the courage, the confidence that we could get there. By publicly stating our goal, and by putting a specific time period on a very specific accomplishment, President Kennedy gave us no way out. We either had to do it or fail. No one of us was interested in failing. Space was our new frontier, and I wanted to be a part of getting there and go there myself if I could. After completing my tour of duty here in Germany in 1959, I decided to continue my education and received my doctorate in astronautics from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. For my thesis, I adapted my experience as a fighter pilot intercepting enemy aircraft and devised a technique for two spacecraft to meet in space called Man Orbital Rendezvous. Little did anyone know, including me, just how critical that work would become to our successfully landing on the moon and then getting back. And in all further space exploration, the first time I applied to be a NASA astronaut, I was turned down because I hadn't uh, chosen the path of 
going to test pilot training school. But I was determined and applied again. This time, my fighter pilot experience and NASA's interest in my concept of rendezvous influenced them to accept me in the third group of 14 astronauts. And it wasn't long before I became known by my fellow peers as Dr. Rendezvous. John Hubold, a clever NASA engineer, figured out that if we use two specialized spacecraft at the moon, a command and service module that would remain in orbit around the moon, and then an ascent and descent stage lunar module to land and later rendezvous in orbit with the command and service module, then the lander's rocket didn't have to be so big and the descent stage, the lander, could be left on the lunar surface. The ascent stage, after rendezvous, would be left in lunar orbit. The critical key to